So what you see behind me is, for my personal view, one of the most iconic mines in the entire mining industry. We move roughly 150 million tons of earth every single year to make sure that we always have access to our ore body. Copper mines, like this one in Utah, are on the front line of America's transition to clean energy. This site, owned and operated by mining giant Rio Tinto, produces roughly 200,000 metric tons of copper annually. Global demand for copper, a major component of EVs, is expected to almost double from 25 million metric tons to nearly 49 million metric tons by 2035. But miners face a multitude of issues as they ramp up production, not least of which includes mitigating environmental damage, addressing the concerns of the local stakeholders, and operating in remote regions of the world. We're definitely part of the energy transition solution. The challenge is, of course, uh, we have to provide the materials to meet this increasing demand. Mining is also difficult and potentially dangerous work. Here at Rio Tinto's Kennecott Mining Operation on the outskirts of Salt Lake City, three quarters of a mile beneath the surface, miners work around the clock digging for copper. That material is then loaded onto 350-ton trucks and hauled to the surface. You know, when you first get on up here, you get in this thing and it feels like, oh my gosh, I'm driving a house around. But yeah, after a couple of weeks, you, you kind of get used to it because everything up here is so big. Adjacent to the mine, a smelter and refinery help process the extracted material into 99.9% .9 pure copper. As to why there's going to be a real problem with this transition over the next 10 years is that it is very, very hard for these companies to even maintain the level of production that they have at the moment. Based in the UK, Rio Tinto is one of the world's largest mining companies, with projects in 35 countries. In addition to its 17 iron ore mines in Western Australia that produce material used in steel, its products include aluminum, diamonds, and boron, a component in fertilizer and smartphones. Historically, miners have been known for their environmental impact, but today are increasingly recognized as crucial players in the transition to green energy. So what is Rio Tinto doing to ramp up production of its critical minerals business, and how will China's economic slowdown impact its iron ore sector? CNBC got a behind-the-scenes look at Rio Tinto's Utah operation to find out. Extracting minerals from beneath the surface is challenging work. All right, so we're drilling a, a hole about 50 feet down in, into the ground. We load that with ammonium nitrate and fuel oil, and then we, we have to fracture that rock. So that's kind of step one. The Kennecott operation in Utah opened in 1903 and was purchased by Rio Tinto in 1989. Large enough to be seen from space, it is the second largest copper mine in the U.S. At the bottom of the pit, shovels extract ore containing just 0.5% copper. Small amounts of gold and silver are also captured. So as a haul truck driver, uh, our shift starts at 6 in the morning. Our team leaders will let us know what's going on in the pit, if there's any shovel moves, um, any incidents, if there's anything dangerous we need to be aware of. Using a four-mile conveyor system, softball-sized rocks are taken to the concentrator, where they are broken up into dust. A chemical process called flotation grabs the metal, creating a copper concentrate of roughly 25%. A 12-mile pipeline then transfers the material to a smelter. Now this is really where you know, the, the actual metals processing uh, begins. You can think of a copper smelter as basically a series of furnaces. We're making a 700 pound anode, which is 99% pure copper. That copper plate is then transported by train to a refinery where it sits for almost two weeks in a bath of low concentrated sulfuric acid. Mixed with electricity, 
the final product is 99.9% .9 pure copper. Nearly 100% of everything that, cop, that Kennecott makes stays within North America with, with roughly 90 to 95% of that staying right here in the United States. And that consumption is predicted to soar. Renewable power systems like wind and solar are at least five times more copper intensive than conventional power. To meet that demand, Rio Tinto expanded its footprint at Kennecott, invested more than $2 billion to modernize the mine and its adjacent facilities, and is trying to open an underground copper mine 60 miles east of Phoenix. I think Kennecott has a long future ahead of it, and uh, we're hoping to increase its copper production anywhere between 30 to 40 percent over the next uh, five years or so. Having said that, um, Arizona um, is the copper state. It's where 70 percent of U.S. copper is produced, and uh, we would like to actually be a significant contributor and potentially build one of the top 10 copper mines in the world. The U.S. has the sixth largest copper reserves globally, about 44 million metric tons behind Chile and four other nations. About half of America's copper supply is imported, and that could jump to two-thirds by 2035. The road's down and no one's driving, and we're not making money. Got to keep the wheels turning. Rio Tinto got its start 150 years ago in 1873, after the Spanish government sold a group of mines in the south of that country to a consortium of banks for roughly $4 million. A decade later, the London-based operator was supplying about 10% of the world's copper. By 1958, it had expanded operations to copper mines in what is now Zambia and was looking for uranium in Canada and Australia but it was iron ore that propelled the company's growth. Rio made its first shipment of iron ore from its operations in Western Australia to Japan in 1966. A handful of years later, it moved into China. By 2016, the company had exported over 5 billion metric tons of iron ore from Western Australia. About 98% of the world's iron ore is used to make steel. We have had really good relationships with our Chinese partners throughout. We sell uh, uh, more than half of our products into China. In 1985, Rio Tinto acquired a 30% stake in the Escondida copper mine in Chile, the world's largest copper producing mine. Its stock price soared in 2007 on speculation of a takeover by rival BHP, but later fell partly due to the state of the global economy. It bought Canadian aluminum maker Alcan for $38 billion that same year. Rio Tinto's mineral business brought in $58 billion in revenue in 2022. Its iron ore segment made up 53% of those sales, followed by aluminum, minerals, which include diamond mining, and copper. The market cap of the top 40 mining companies, including BHP, Glencore, and Southern Copper, was more than $1.2 trillion in 2022, up from about $400 billion in 2003. While running a mine is technically challenging, starting a new one might be even harder. It takes 10 to 15 years to build these mines, but I think the most important challenge is not the technical one about can we build the mines or can we build the manufacturing sites. It's actually how do we work with governments to accelerate the permitting and the approval processes to match these. Attempts to launch Rio Tinto, Arizona's Resolution Copper project have been ongoing for more than two decades. Along with minority partner BHP, Rio Tinto has so far spent $2 billion. Native American groups and environmentalists have opposed the project, which could become one of the largest underground mines globally. There's a very serious constraint on mining companies to get permits in the U.S. It's, it's one of the hardest jurisdictions in the world. Rio has seen challenges in other parts of the world, too. The company began mining copper in Olyutolgoi, Mongolia in 2011, but faced ongoing disputes with the government there as plans to open an underground mine fell behind schedule and over budget. 
production began in 2023, and the mine could one day produce the copper equivalent to what's needed for 16,400 electric battery vehicles daily. Building a mine in the Gobi Desert, uh, in the middle of, you know, literally nowhere, you know, you're by the Chinese border, you're, you know, uh, 600 kilometers from the capital in Mongolia. It is, it is a really difficult place to build a mine. In 2020, Rio Tinto CEO Jean Sebastian Jacques resigned following the destruction of a 46,000 year old Aboriginal cave in Australia. Australia's mines provided 85% of Rio's profits at the time. It's been three years. We continue to learn. We continue to adapt our mining practices. We have a lot of uh, work and ground to cover still. But um, the entire Rio Tinto family is absolutely focused on this endeavor. We're a $100 billion market cap company. We are one of the largest mining companies in the world. We take our reputation very seriously. We don't take shortcuts and we follow due regulatory process. Another challenge the mining industry and Rio Tinto face is a lack of workers. More than half of the current mining workforce in the U.S., or about 220,000 people, will retire and need to be replaced by 2029. And so the industry really has got a missing generation in effect in terms of the, the skilled people to be able to build projects move forward. A lot of people from the last cycle are now in their late 50s and their early 60s. To increase productivity, the company has turned to automation. Because it isn't the old school mining that people have always thought. We're not sitting here with pickaxe and mine carts. We're using high tech technology. From its offices in Perth, roughly a thousand miles away, operators monitor autonomous drilling rigs and autonomous haul trucks deployed at the company's network of 17 iron ore mines in Australia's western Pilbara region. I think we've got about 370 autonomous haul trucks in our fleet out of, out of a total number of just above 400. So it's a very high percentage now that, that are autonomous and we will progressively continue to, to increase that number. In 2018, each truck operated on average 700 hours more than conventional haul trucks with 15% lower costs. The company also launched an autonomous train in 2019. Like its haul trucks, the trains are monitored from its operation headquarters in Perth and run on a 1,200-mile rail network. The challenge is, is that you need to have a significantly long mine life to be able to make the capital allocation decisions. Um, you need to have a relatively homogenous ore body. And despite those technological advances, Boots on the ground, as well as access to new mines, will likely remain key as mining companies like Rio Tinto ramp up production for the coming EV boom. Theoretically, there are enough reserves in the U.S. that we could become independent for a copper need. We could. It's just how do we do that? How do we get the permits? How do we get the acceptance of the public? How do we work through those challenges?